of the galaxy we call the Milky Way. Thank you again. It's, it's great to be here, and I, I, and I want to welcome those of you who were here last night. And, uh, yay! And, and those who weren't here last night, boo! No. Um, it's, it's, uh, this is a wonderful weekend for us at, at the Origins Project, and, and, uh, and tonight is going to be a great night, and I'm very excited about it. I, I want to repeat one thing I did say last night uh, for those who, who weren't here. Um, for me, it, and for all of us, it, it is a true privilege to be located in a place, this place, where we can fill up 3,000-seat auditorium for science. And, 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 and it's, uh, it says great things. True. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it says great things for all of you, and I, we really appreciate it. But tonight is an amazing evening because without hyperbole, I, I, it is true that I don't think there has ever been on one stage an assembly of science storytellers and communicators like this. It, it is, they've never, it's, it's, uh, it's very intimidating, in fact. Uh, I have had the good fortune, I, I realize, to appear on stage with each one of these people individually, but all together. It's going to be an amazing night. And, and the way it's going to work, when you got great jazz musicians, you allow them to jam. And so the way we're going to do it is, uh, is we're going to bring everyone out in a, in a minute or two, and everyone's going to tell a little science story uh, uh, for you, to give you a sense of what excites them about science or, or to how they interpret science. And each one of the people will do that. And, then we'll, and, then, and that should take a while, and then we'll take a break. Then we'll come back and we're going to have a discussion then and we're going to open it up to all of you. I believe you have questionnaires, question cards. If you want to, if you want to um, write down your question in the inter by the intermission, bring them down and then we'll choose some questions and uh, after we have our discussion we'll, we'll try and answer your questions. So that's the, that's the way it's going to go. So I want to introduce the, each of the panelists uh, um, in, in, in order. The first uh, person is, is uh, that I want to introduce is the, uh, the director of a remarkable festival, which is, I would say, next to the Origins Project, the most amazing science <laughs> festival in, in, uh, in the country. The World Science Festival in New York City, and I've been privileged to be part of it four or five times. And Tracy Day is the CEO of that, a former broadcast journalist, and puts together this remarkable program of 30 to 40 different science events throughout New York, and uh, with lots of different scientists and and musicians, and, and, and uh, it's an amazing event, and it's been a privilege for me to be a part of it. So I want to bring out Tracy Day first. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, next, I, I want to bring out a, uh, an old friend of mine, and, um, and one of the most well-known physicists in the country. Uh, he burst like a supernova on the stage of the public stage with his first book, uh, The Elegant Universe. Um, and I think of him as a, a long-lost son, really. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Brian and I have been, been, been together in many venues, and he is really one of the most remarkable and, and vibrant communicators of physics, particularly of particle physics, uh, in the country. And it's really a pleasure to ha welcome him back to the stage today. Brian? Papa. <laughs> okay, enough, enough. enough. That, that love, I feel it. Um, <laughs> thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm not turning my back to you, I think. But uh, the next person I want to bring on stage uh, is another old friend, and, and I've been privileged to be on his program a number of times. And, he is really one of the most amazing, well, he has the most amazing radio program 
in the country on, uh, about science. But uh, if you've been on the program and, and you've experienced it, you can see what an amazing job he does in interviewing people. Brian and I and, and uh, Ian McEwen were on earlier this week. And when you're on there, you see the incredible talent. And I know that when I try and moderate these panels, what I think is I'm trying to channel Ira Flato. And so I'm happy to bring out Ira Flato. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, next, I want to bring out uh, a little guy um, who uh, is now uh, everywhere. He's on TV. He's about to make a new series, a remake of the Cosmos series. And he's the director of the Hyden Planetarium. And in fact, I was privileged enough to be there last week for, for an event that he moderated. And now I'm going to return that favor to him and not let him talk either. Um, and uh, he's a little shy, but I think we can encourage him to come out. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> you're, you're, no, no, you're over there. Oh, well, hold on. No, he's You're not over there. You're over there. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Next, we have, as I said last night, in my own mind, the person we all look up to as one of the greatest writers about science in, in the history of science and, and someone who changed the way science writing is done and communication is done with his book, A Selfish Gene, which was published almost 40 years ago. And it's a surprise guest because he wasn't in the original program, but he was here last night and uh, it would be, it would be, we'd be remiss if we didn't include in this program Richard Dawkins. Now, the next guy is a real guy. In fact, he's a science guy. And uh, what else? <laughs> I don't think I have to say anything else. Bill Nye has been an amazing educator on television. I love watching him in Disney World each time I go to Epcot Center. And uh, uh, he's been a pleasure to interact with. He's also the executive director of the, of the Planetary Society, which is a position that, that Carl Sagan first had. And uh, it is truly a pleasure and a privilege to welcome the stage Bill Nye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you take care of that. An amazing group. <laughs> and the last person I want to welcome to the stage is a little bit different, but in fact, he communicates science in a different way. In my mind, personally, I think he is the best science fiction writer writing today. He is incredibly prolific. I don't know how he, how he produces what he produces. And I've been with him in a number of events, and, and, and he has an incredible following. He, in, he, he, he weaves science in his stories in a way that very few science fiction writers really do effectively. And it's truly, again, a privilege to welcome Neil Stevenson to the stage. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to begin, if we go to the first slide, actually. And as all of my colleagues will point out to you, it's always about me. <laughs> and so the story, I want to tell you a little science story, and it's a story about me. In a way, it's a story about what got me interested in science, because I thought, that would be appropriate. This person here is Richard Feynman. This young person here is, is me. And Richard Feynman made me want to be a scientist for a number of reasons. Uh, when I was a high school student, I took a, a special some summer program and I was bored. And the teacher came down 
and, and said, you look bored, and he gave me a book. And in fact, I think if, if this works, it does. This was the book. Uh, it's called The Character of Physical Law by Richard Feynman. And he said, look, this is a book by a guy who won the Nobel Prize recently for proving that antiparticles are particles going backwards in time. Oh, wow, this is amazing. So I took the book home, and I read the chapter. I didn't understand any of it. Um, <laughs> but it was really neat. But what, the thing that was important for me, and I, I hope all of one, of, one of the things I like to tell students, because we tend to teach science, as I said the other night, by, as if it's done by dead white men. And when I looked at this, I realized, you know, not all the problems are solved. There's still an incredible number of things we need to, to understand about the universe. And it was the first time that I thought a career in physics might actually be worthwhile. Might be, you might, there were things left to discover, that all the great things hadn't been known. And it changed my life completely. Now, like all good physics undergraduates, I'm sure Brian and Neil at very least, I carried around with me the Feynman lectures on physics. Uh, he rewrote all of introductory physics in his own style. He, he was incredibly charismatic and an amazing teacher. And I carried them around. Again, I couldn't understand them. Uh, but I thought by osmosis, I would, I, if I carried them around long enough. It was only when I was a graduate student that I really began to appreciate the depth of those descriptions. And that kind of, as I thought of being an educator, the idea, what was amazing about Feynman was that he conveyed his excitement and his interest and the integrity of science as I'll talk about in a second. Now, I was lucky enough, as it turned out, when I was an undergraduate to meet Feynman at a, at a meeting up in Canada, and uh, this was actually taken in for, for a physics magazine, and I'm pleased we were actually talking physics at that instant, but uh, I spent most of the weekend with him because um, I brought my girlfriend at the time, and she was one of the few women, and um, Feynman, if you knew anything about Feynman, he, was, he decided to spend most of his time with us, and... Um, and uh, Besides actually teaching me how to dance, he convinced me we had long talks about adventure and seeking out adventure. And I know for me, for him, science was an adventure, and it is for me, but it was everything in life was an adventure. Learning, just the pleasure of finding things out, as he wrote. And, and, that, and that became infectious for me and, and, uh, and, 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 and invigorated me to become a, uh, a scientist. Now, it turned out many years later, when I, when I was at Harvard, I, I gave a colloquium at... at uh, at Caltech, where Feynman was, was teaching. And, um, and, he, and it was very intimidating, of course, but he asked a good question. Then he came up afterwards to talk to me. And I really wanted to remind him. I, knew, I was certain he wouldn't remember our weekend together. And, uh, and he wanted to ask me a question, but there was a very annoying assistant professor who would not stop asking me questions. I'm very happy to say he didn't get tenure. Uh, <laughs> but, but Feynman... But Feynman walked off, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll catch him later. But he died shortly afterwards, so I never was able to, to, to tell him what he meant to me. And, I, and, and, and as a result, I wrote a whole book about Richard Feynman, because uh, for me, he captured the, the way science is done. And I'm going to let him tell you in the last minute his own story, or at least a, uh, the way he saw science. But, but, but I, I want to tell you one of the facts about science, the kind of things that would amaze him and amaze me. All of you take a breath. Hold it in. I can't see. Are you still holding? No, you can let it out now. Okay, good. Well, it is, there's a non... There's a, there's a possibility, in fact, a likely possibility, that with every breath you take, you are breathing in atoms that Richard Feynman breathed out when he, when he, he gave the interview I'm about to show you. And every time I'm sitting at my desk, not getting anything done, <laughs> feeling ignorant and incompetent, I like to think that I'm breathing in atoms from Richard Feynman. And that sense of joy and mystery, to me, is what science is all about. And no one conveyed it better than Feynman, and so I'll let him finish this off in his own words. You see, one thing is I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything, and there are many things I don't know anything about, such as whether it means anything to ask why we're here and what the question might mean. I might think about it a little bit. If I can't figure it out, then I go to something else. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't, have to, I don't feel frightened by not knowing things. 
by being lost in the mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell, possibly. It doesn't frighten me. He wasn't frightened, and he loved mysteries, and that's what science is all about, to me. Thanks.